This is my PC, my main editing PC that I use to make all of my videos at KitGuru. And this is the Geekom GT1 Mega Mini PC. I'm 99% sure that the Mega in the name means Mega Small. Now, mini PCs are getting more and more powerful, but a constant theme we've seen in anything that pairs a small footprint with powerful components is overheating and thermal throttling. Can the GT1 Mega handle the heat? Let's find out, shall we? Hi guys, I'm Matt and welcome to Kit Guru. So let's start with the pricing as we always do then. The GT1 Mega comes in just one spec, which simplifies the price. It's currently £949 on Geekom's website on sale from a full RRP of £1,089. I said simplified, I didn't say cheap. That's getting very close to the price of a new entry level, latest gen gaming desktop, like the Topaz Supreme R from PC Specialist that I looked at back in June. And if you build your own system, the pricing is likely to be even closer. Geekom have, though, they've again sent us over a discount code to pass on to you. It'll bag you 20% off if you want to use it, and you'll find it in the video's description. Now, we don't get any kickback or commission or anything like that from it, though. That's not something we do or will ever do here at KitGuru. You can read more about that and our ethics via the link in the video's description, too. So this tiny PC has a lot to live up to with a price tag like that. Let's take a look at the specs. The CPU inside this tiny box is an Intel Core Ultra 9 185H. That's a step down from the 285H found in the Geekom IFT15 that I reviewed recently. The 185H features 16 cores in total, six performance cores running at a base clock speed of 2.3 gigahertz and then boosting up to 5.1 gigahertz on paper. Then it's got eight efficiency cores running at 1.8 gigahertz base and 3.8 gigahertz boost. Then finally, you've got two low power efficiency cores, which Intel State will run at one gigahertz base clock speed and then they'll boost up to two and a half gigahertz. The processor runs on the same 45 watt base power rating as the 285H that I mentioned just now and is capable of hitting 115 watts when it's running on Intel's recommended power settings and boosting and stuff like that. For memory, the GT1 Mega comes with 32 gig of DDR5 running at 5600 mega transfers. It's dual channel and it's occupying both of the system's SO DIMM slots. The system can cater for up to 64 gig of memory though if you need that much which I find it a bit weird that you can't choose to increase the included memory when you order a system. Geekom, you should definitely add that to your websites, but don't go all Apple on the pricing, keep it fair. The specific memory found inside the GT1 Mega is made by Crucial, as is the storage that we're gonna take a look at in a moment. Testing the memory that's installed in the system with ADA resulted in read speeds of 80,626 megabytes per second and write speeds of 74,131 megabytes per second. For storage, we have a two terabyte SSD as standard. Again, this isn't customizable when ordering a GT1 Mega or any of the PCs that I've looked at from Geekom. A bit of flexibility when choosing to pick up a Geekom mini PC would be a welcome addition in my opinion, just like I said about the memory. Anywho, the drive in this PC is a crucial P3 Plus PCIe Gen 4 M.2 NVMe SSD. That's always a mouthful. It's the same drive as we saw in the IT15 from the last Geekon review. It's a decent enough drive with speeds that are going to be plenty fast enough for 99% of users. Write speeds came in at 5,051 megabytes per second, and read speeds were around 4,350 megabytes per second when I tested it with Crystal Disk Mark. The two terabyte capacity, that's going to be plenty for general day-to-day -day use and it will handle gaming and some like productivity work with ease in terms of capacity and speed to be fair. Now moving on, obviously tiny mini PCs like this have or they have to have custom built motherboards. The one inside the GT1 Mega does house an additional M.2 slot for another SSD, but it's limited to 2242 size and SATA speeds, exactly the same setup again as we saw in the IT15. 
As for general connectivity, the GT1 Mega has four USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A ports on the front, one of which has the ability to pass through power even when the machine's turned off. Alongside those front USB ports is a 3.5mm headphone jack and the power button, which illuminates when the system is turned on. Then around the back, we have two more USB Type A ports. One is 3.2 Gen 2 and then the other is 2.0. Alongside that, there's two USB 4 40 gig ports, both of which support DisplayPort 1.4 output, and one of them will handle up to 15 watts of power delivery, meaning it should be able to power and send a display signal to like a portable external monitor, which really interests me. I'll maybe try that the next time I'm traveling for work, and I'll let you know how it goes in a future video. To further add to the display capabilities of the GT1 Mega, it's also got two HDMI ports. Geekon don't list what spec they are. I'm guessing 2.0, but I haven't dug any deeper and tested it out. These two, coupled with the two USB ports that I just mentioned, means that the GT1 Mega is capable of outputting video to up to four 4K or a single 8K display. I don't have either four 4K displays or an 8K display, so I guess we're gonna to have to take their word for it. For wired networking, there's a pair of two and a half gig ethernet ports. One is obviously for redundancy, which that's gonna be useful for business use cases. If any of these are put in like in retail environments and stuff like that, where they're gonna be remotely managed by IT teams, having redundant networking if one of them fails is really really useful although the majority of people just sticking this on a desk or behind a monitor just to use it like as normal i suppose will just use the one network port then of course the final port on the back is for the power adapter and it's for connecting the 120 watt power brick that comes in the box on the left hand side of the chassis there's an sd card reader then on the right there's a kensington lock for securing the machine and stopping it from getting nicked for wireless connectivity the gt1 mega supports wi-fi 7 and bluetooth 5.4 via the intel m.2 wireless card that's inside it overall then that's a pretty solid amount of connectivity although just like in my last geekon review i'd like to see a usb c port or two on the front and I've, I'd also, I'd love it if Geekon would start putting Oculent ports on their machines, as I've been kind of looking into and itching to try out some eGPU setups lately. USB 4 will do eGPU connections, but not quite as good or with as low latency as an Oculink connection can. So if you can, Geekon, stick some Oculink support on at least one or two of your devices. If you're looking for a new chair, then definitely go and check out Boolies.co.uk. They offer a whole host of gaming and office chairs that come in a variety of different finishes and different colours. The design of the GT1 Mega is very, very similar to previous Geek Harmony PCs that we've looked at on the channel. The case is tiny, measuring just 135 by 132 by 44 millimetres. It's got a very Mac Mini inspired look to it and it feels just as premium as one. I no longer have one, but I did used to use one for a while and this feels pretty much the same as it. The chassis is made from metal, it's smooth to the touch and then it's got rounded edges which give it kind of a quality look and a premium feel. There's venting machined into the case on the left and right hand side and then you've got some on the plastic IO shroud at the back of it. Cooling is handled by the same Ice Blast 2.0 system that we saw in the IT15, so we may be in for some pretty high temperatures. We're going to look at that along with the thermals and all that sort of stuff later in the video. The cooler in the, the GT1 Mega and the IT15 features dual copper pipes, and according to Geekom, it's 52% more efficient than standard thermal systems. We'll put that to the test. Taking the GT1 Mega apart to access its guts is pretty simple. You just have to remove the four rubber feet on the bottom and then remove four screws, and then you get to another four screws. I will say though, removing the inner tray by removing that second set of four screws and then getting access to the board and the components is easy enough when you're disassembling the machine, but reconnecting the Wi-Fi antenna cables when putting the thing back together was a massive pain in the ass. The cables came kind of too tight without enough slack 
to connect them and then reinstall the SSD over the top and then place the plate back in. I ended up having to remove the tape that was holding them in place and then put everything back together and then retape it all down. That's, it's not a mega hassle, but it's definitely different to the other Geekon mini PCs that I've looked at in the past. This one was more of a pain to get into and have a look at what was going on in there. Let's move on to some testing then. The machine came with Windows 11 Pro installed out of the box and there wasn't any bloatware installed at all either. All I've done before running it through the test is update Windows and obviously install all the stuff that I need to install. I'm gonna start by saying, as we talk about light gaming and productivity, for day-to-day -day use, you know, like the boring stuff like spreadsheets, word processing, just general browsing, the GT1 Mega will handle it all with ease. It's a powerful little system that won't really break a sweat when being used casually. It'll handle some light 4K editing too, just as the IT15 did. This time around, the CPU is a generation older. It's slightly worse. Reviews put it at being 15% around that worse on multi-threaded workloads and then roughly 20% on single-threaded. But that being said though, it performs well enough if you're just editing casually or as a hobby and stuff. If you're editing every day, or certainly if you're editing professionally, I definitely 100% opt for a full desktop system or like, you know, a MacBook Pro, whatever you want to use. But maybe that's just me. I wouldn't use this day in, day out for work. Let's take a look at some gaming performance then and how the integrated art graphics handles things. As I don't know about you, but I dream of the day that a tiny PC like this can perform as well as a fully fledged gaming desktop. That's likely going to be just a dream for a long time yet, but one's got to hope, I suppose. All games I tested were running at 1080p with their settings at their very, very lowest. Kicking things off at the lower end of the game in demand scale then with Counter-Strike 2, the least taxing game in the lineup today, I would hazard a guess at saying. Performance in Counter-Strike was pretty decent, if you can deal with the graphics looking like you're playing on a PlayStation 3. Frames per second hit around 100 at times during this quick practice match with a few bots. That's not amazing, but it's definitely playable, especially when we remember that we're not actually using a dedicated GPU in this system. Next up is Marvel Rivals, another esportsy competitive shooter, but this time things are quite a bit more demanding on the system. First up is rasterized 1080p performance, measured using the game's built-in benchmark. The FPS meter hovered around the 20 to 25 level throughout, with frame time readings coming in between 30 to 50 milliseconds, and there was a bit of stutter, which can be slightly alleviated with the use of XESS scaling, Turning that on at its performance preset sees around 20 FPS added to the native performance with the meter sitting around 40 to 45 most of the time and the frame times coming down to around 20 to 25 milliseconds. Then we have a run through the built-in benchmark of Red Dead Redemption 2, one of my favorite games of all time. During the opening section of the benchmark with the sweeping vistas and panoramas, the FPS meter impressed me. Hovering around 50 on average, sometimes pushing up to 60 plus, the number that I always like to aim for when dealing with low settings and integrated graphics and stuff like that. Moving on a little bit through the benchmark to the outdoor scenes when Arthur comes into play, doesn't see much of a difference on the FPS meter, we're still hitting around 50 here, but it does highlight how much graphical fidelity you'll lose when you play at the lowest settings. The textures look terrible on everything apart from Arthur himself. Even still, I think the bottom line is if you've never played this game or experienced this game at all, playing it like this is better than not playing it at all. And finally, some Cyberpunk 2077 then, a staple in our gaming benchmarks here at KitGuru. Running it at 1080p with the settings on their lowest on the GT1 Mega results in FPS of around 25 to 30 and frame times of roughly 35 milliseconds. It still looks pretty decent though, and you can't see as much of a compromise in graphics quality as we did in Red Dead Redemption 2. Turning on XESS at the performance preset again then, gives us a similar jump in figures as we saw in Marvel Rivals. The FPS rises by about 20, sitting in the high 40s and very, very rarely creeping up to 50, which in turn sees frame times drop to around 20 milliseconds on average. So gaming performance then is a hard one to summarize on mini PCs like this. While on the one hand it's decent, especially if you're gonna play older or less demanding games, considering the form factor of the machine itself, it's good 
for some very light gaming in like your downtime from work. But then when I think about the price, it makes it harder to justify. As I mentioned at the start of the video, it's very, very close to an entry level gaming PC. So if gaming is your sole focus, I'd always recommend going down that route. But then again, the GT1 Mega wasn't designed to be a dedicated game machine, so it swings and roundabouts. Looking to buy a gaming PC? Then you need to visit CyberPower PC. We'll help you with the best spec at a price you'll love. With us, you get five years warranty, a lifetime of technical support, and systems built by experts. So it's no wonder so many gamers choose CyberPower PC. Before I wrap the review up then, let's move on to the area where all mini PCs and high-spec gaming laptops seem to disappoint heat and thermal performance in particular when under intensive CPU bound workloads. Running the GT1 Mega through the sustained 30 minute tests in Cinebench R23, both on single and multi-core workloads, paints a very, very familiar picture as to what we've seen in the past. Although this time around, that picture isn't as almost as hot as the sun. Taking a look at CPU performance in a bit more detail with Cinebench then, starting with a 30 minute sustained multi-core run. The clock speeds briefly boost to their maximum of 5.1 GHz, with the CPU hitting its PL2 power limits of 70 watts. This in turn causes the CPU package temperature to spike up to around the mid 90-ish degrees. After about 15 seconds, PL1 power limits kick in, which sees the CPU package power usage drop to 45 watts, as we'd expect to see. And then the knock-on effect of that is, of course, lower temperatures. They drop down to around 80 degrees, and then, of course, again, lower clock speeds, with P-cores now running at around 3.4 gigahertz. Single-core performance doesn't see the clock speeds jumping around as much. The GT1 Mega is capable of maintaining 5.1 gigahertz while working through a 30-minute Cinebench single-core run. Power usage sticks around 27 watts roughly on average and CPU temperatures, while still peaking in the 90s, sit in the 70s or the 80s sort of level most of the time. So overall, thermal performance is handled better in the GT1 Mega when compared to some of the mini PCs and laptops that I've looked at in the past. Power management using PL1 and PL2 power limits works as expected, but things do still get quite a bit toasty when running through very intensive multi-core workloads as they were always going to when something with such a powerful processor is in such a tiny case. Taking a look at the thermal camera then to see how that all translates to real world heat buildup in and around the case. This is a five minute section of video which has been sped up and was taken while the system was working through a multi-core Cinebench benchmark. And finally then, system noise and total system power usage when measured at the socket in three different scenarios was as follows. So there we have it then, that was my full review of the Geekom GT1 Mega, a tiny and pretty powerful mini PC. And my sort of final thoughts are very similar to those which I had about the IT15, again from Geekom. Mini PCs are a bit of a niche product. They're cool, don't get me wrong, I think they're cool anyway. But if you're just a regular PC user looking for a system for work, then why not just get a desktop? If you need something for portability, then laptops are a thing. As for this machine specifically, it's well made, it looks nice, it's got decent I.O. But if you're going to drop £900 plus on it, then why not go for the IT15 and get a Core Ultra 9 285H CPU instead of the 185H found in the GT1 Mega. It's not that there's anything particularly wrong with it, aside from that heat, which, to be fair, that was marginally better than we've seen in the past. It's just that this mini PC doesn't make sense when compared to some of Geekom's other offerings. And it's just a bit samey, I suppose. That's the thoughts I'm left with anyway. Geekom, I think the ball's in your court. Work some magic and give us something a little bit more exciting. And that's the end of the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave me a like down below if you did. And don't forget to subscribe to Kit Guru to keep up with the latest PC gaming news and reviews. If you go down below this video, there's links to our merch and stuff so you can grab yourself some t-shirts and rep Kit Guru while you're out touching grass. And then in the video's description, you're going to find more links 
to our Discord server, our Patreon page, and our website. And then, oh, in this one, there's that discount code for 20% off if you want to pick one of these things up as well. Anyway, guys, I've been Matt. This has been the GT1 Mega Mini PC from Geekom. I'll switch in the next one. Look after yourselves. See you later.